Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, church family. And we knew a beautiful Simi Valley morning like this was coming. So, uh, again, again, um, well, some of us I know actually love this kind of fall breeze. So that's if that's you, that's great. What a what a gift the breeze is. And um, some of us may chase some sheet music or something here. So don't be alarmed if that happens this morning. Um, just act natural. Um, but hey, we have uh, we have the codes like we've been doing that you can scan for song lyrics, or some of you grab those packets on the way in. And uh, as uh, as you pull those up, can we stand together and start the morning off and and sing and worship our great God, our saving God, together this morning? a seat this morning. Well, welcome and good morning. I'm sure most of you have seen this trough behind me filled with water. Uh, No, we are not bobbing for apples this morning. Uh, We have uh, the privilege of witnessing and sharing in the joy of two young ladies who are being baptized this morning. So 
if there's anyone here, friends and family, or people all the way out in the balcony, if you want to make your way forward, please feel free to do so now. Uh, and you can come up here on the grass if you would like. Just wanted to make that available to you. So come on down. Um, baptism is an essential part of discipleship. Jesus commanded it. Uh, and the church has practiced it from, the early, from its earliest beginnings. Baptism has no saving quality. It does not merit or earn any favor with God. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And those who have put their faith in Christ are baptized in order to publicly identify with Christ and to publicly identify with his finished work. And it is also a public um, declaration of intent to follow Christ with their lives. So this morning we have, first we have Lexi Amador from the college group. Lexi, would you come and share your story with us? Hi, my name's Lexi. My parents enrolled me at Grace in Kindergarten, and I went to school there throughout elementary. I'm currently 18 and just graduated from Grace. Growing up there, I was surrounded by God and was taught his word daily. We prayed every day before school and before lunch. It was always a task and something on the agenda to me. In elementary school, one of my close friends at the time was going to Awana at Grace Church on Wednesday nights and invited me to go. After that, I walked next door almost every Wednesday. There I began to make a lot of new friends and form relationships with my Iwana leaders. Shortly after, I started going to church on Sunday mornings along with my older brother, Christian. I went Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, but I never really took anything away from either one of them. It was simply a fun place to go where I would memorize Bible verses, hang out with friends, and play games. Church was just another thing added to my life that I was doing to keep me busy. It wasn't a priority, but another thing to do if it fit around my schedule. I knew a lot about God and what his word taught, but I didn't truly know him. That pattern repeated for the rest of the year. As I started my seventh grade year, my brother encouraged me to get involved in Grace's youth group with Eric Durso at the time. I went to my first summer camp with Grace Church in 2014. There I found myself completely consumed with the people around me. I had never felt a more welcoming and loving environment. I built deep relationships with my youth group leaders, one of them being Stacy Combe, who was always caring towards me over the years and has always been deeply involved in my life and has walked alongside me. Others being Jen Duffield and Ashley Durso, who took me under their wing like I was theirs. After going to summer camp, I began to have a desire to go to church and youth group, but I believe my motives were wrong and I wasn't going to church for the right purpose. I struggled a lot with the concept of surrendering my life to Christ completely before I was saved. I wanted control in a lot of situations and wished to do everything independently. My life was selfish, and I was constantly consumed with myself and my own desires. I was more focused on taking control rather than letting Christ take control. I confessed that I'm a sinner and acknowledged that he died for me. I began to finally trust that my life was no longer my own but his. I started doing tracks with my youth group leader, Jen, at the time. We went through the motions of what being a Christian looks like, living out his word, and having assurance that I was saved. When I was at my lowest points that year, God drew me to himself. I felt the love of Christ and an overwhelming desire to be with my church family. I had a great desire to go to church to hear more about Christ and to learn how I can deepen my relationship with him. I'm really thankful that the Lord placed me in Grace Church and blessed me with my friends and family who encouraged me and pointed me back to scripture. The Lord challenged me in various ways during the process. I look back today and see how the Lord grew me and how he was faithful through it all. I'm grateful for the people God put in my life. I'm thankful for my parents for enrolling me at Grace and how they raised me to have good moral values. I'm thankful for my mom for being involved in my life. My grandparents for always being there when I needed them. For CJ who always encouraged me through the hardest times of God's sovereignty and goodness through it all. For Dina, who was always there for me when I needed anything and been involved in my life. I'm thankful for all my youth group leaders, especially Amay and Stacy, who have exemplified traits of faithfulness and dedication to the church. They have encouraged and invested me over the years. I'm thankful to be a part of this church and the believers here. 
Over the years, the Lord has worked in my heart greatly, and I'm excited to share that I want to be baptized because I love Christ and I want to publicly declare my commitment to Christ and share how the Lord worked in my life and saved me. Being a Christian isn't about earning his love or salvation. It's a free gift he gives to every believer, and that's a huge blessing in my life. My life is different now that I have him in it. It is an easier but greater with him. He has given me fulfillment, purpose, and satisfaction. I'm excited to see how the Lord is going to use me and mold me in the years to come, and I'm very excited to be baptized. Thank you. Next, we have Sophia Stallard from Student Ministry. Hi, I'm Sophia. Okay. My life before Christ consists of loss, depression, self-hatred, and confusion. I was born into this world without the love of a mother and a father. When I was about one and a half, I was adopted by a Christian couple that had four kids of their own. Growing up in a Christian home, I went to church every Sunday and listened to every message. I would go see my friends and have fun and not really take in the message. I always knew about God, but didn't grow a relationship with, a relationship with him until several years later. As I got into middle school, things went downhill. I would always initiate arguments and I was disrespectful to my parents. As I grew closer to my teen years, my mood changed drastically and I showed signs of depression. When I got into high school, these arguments got worse. It would be hard to walk into school every day with a smile on my face when I don't need down. <laughs> when I know deep down, I was hurt. I would attend a public high school and I always felt as if I had to live a double life. At home, I would be one way, and then at school I would show someone completely different. It wasn't until the summer, going into sophomore year, when my depression hit. Normally you would think summer is fun, a time to hang out with friends, but with me, it was, a com it was the complete opposite. I would stay in my room most days and I would usually cry myself to sleep and dwell on the bad things in life. Getting into those arguments with family, not really having friends to hang out with, and the loss of not knowing who my birth parents were all hit me so hard. It wasn't until one day I couldn't take it anymore, so I did what I thought was right. That day was the first time I self-harmed. I thought it was helping I thought it was helping me get through whatever I was feeling at the time, but it just made things worse. My sister noticed my scars and told my parents. Shortly after, my parents made the decision that I would go to this youth group. At that moment, I was so mad at God, and I didn't understand why I had to go to youth group, but little did I know, that was the start of my new life. My first day at youth group, Stacy Cohn was the first person to open her arms out wide and made me feel welcome. At that moment, I didn't know that she would become a huge part of my life. I then met Amay Carvajo, who I also didn't know at the time, but changed my whole life around. Fast forward to my junior year of high school. My sister ran away from home, and months later, she reached out and wanted to come back home, and so we started to do counseling sessions with Peter and Amay. I created a bond with them, and it wasn't until Peter said that we needed to examine ourselves before moving forward, so then I realized that I needed to do what was right and grow my relationship with my parents and stop the constant arguments. I'm not saying that we didn't have occasional bickering, but we were doing so much better. It wasn't until early June when I hit rock bottom. My depression was the worst and I hated the world. At that point, I totally lost sight of God and didn't see any reasons for trying anymore. I started self-harming again and having anxiety attacks and I couldn't control it. My best friend Kevin at the time helped me through what I couldn't get through alone. I felt so lost and numb that when my two friends, Maria and Lucy, came over to see if I was okay, I put on a fake face. It wasn't until June 3rd when I thought no one loved me and I couldn't take it anymore. I tried taking my life but didn't succeed. Four of my best friends, Kevin, Alora, Lucy, and Maria, were all there for me and worked together to contact my siblings and parents. My parents got 
got to me just in time before anything terrible happened and talked with me. I am so beyond grateful to have been blessed with my amazing parents and I can't express how much love I have for them and how much they give for me. After my attempt, I focused more on God and I started to grow my friendship with Lexi. Ever since that day, she's been there for me and I'm blessed to call her one of my best friends. I was slowly recovering from my traumatic experience until one day Lexi calls me and asks if I want to join a Bible, stu a Bible study group with her and me and my sister Carissa. I was hesitant at first, but thought to myself, what if this is something that God is calling me to do? The first time we ever met up, I didn't enjoy it because I had to open up, and at that point in my life, I haven't really opened up to anyone. It, it was new territory for me, but then I realized that this is what God wanted me wanted for me, and I, so, so I opened up my heart and let him in. I engaged in conversation and talked about the things that I struggled with. I started to get really invested in knowing who God is. I was saved at the end of September. It couldn't be any more happier. I was, so invest I was so invested in loss, hatred, and depression for so long, and surrounding my life to Christ has been the best decision in my life. Jesus filled me up with his love and removed all my addictions and suicidal thoughts. I was a sinner who liked to argue, fight, be stubborn, and hate myself and others. I realized, I realized that my depression was wrong because God created me in his image. We are beautifully made in God's image, but I didn't see that. I would focus on my outside appearance more than my inside, and that of itself was a sin. I broke down crying one night and repented and asked God to help me. God saved me from myself, and I have the most free, unbelievable, amaz amazing life that I don't deserve. My walk with the Lord isn't always the easiest, but I look to God when I'm falling and remember the pain he went through to save all of us sinners. God put amazing people in my life, and I couldn't be more blessed. I just want to thank Amay, Stacy Combe, Stacy Elstein, and Peter for, being, for helping me find my way to God. I truly cannot express how much love I have for each one of you and how much you've changed me as a person. I want to also thank Amanda Carvaggio for being just an amazing, godly young woman. You are like an older sister to me, and I love you so much. You have shown me what a godly woman should be, and have taught me so many things. Lastly, I want to thank my parents for being the best role models in my life. Y'all are a great, y'all are a gift from God, and I really don't know what I would do without you. You've taught me love, compassion, and strength, and I love you both so much, and I can't wait to see where you what God has in store for us. It truly is a blessing to be one of God's children and to serve him. God really has changed me drastically through all the things I went through. My thoughts, attitudes, emotions have changed for the better. I do stumble sometimes because we are all sinners and we aren't perfect, but I can't wait to live out my life for God and spread his word to those I love. I go by this verse, Joshua 1, 9, that says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for your Lord. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This verse hits me hard because going through my battles, I thought that God wasn't with me, that he let me down, but looking back at it now, he has always been there for me. He never leaves my side, and ju that just amazes me. Christ sacrificed his life for me and loves me even though I sin. I do not deserve his love and sacrifice. I'm getting baptized today because I made the decision to follow Jesus, and I want people to know that. I want to let people know that God is real. I believe that our faith should be personal but not private. I'm ready to make my faith public, and I'm hoping you can keep me accountable. <laughs> Would you now uh, join me in prayer for these two young ladies? Father, it's such a joy to hear these testimonies of your grace and to witness these baptisms this morning. Uh, Father, baptism is a picture of the gospel, of the good news uh, that is available to all in Jesus Christ. And it's a picture of his, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And Father, it's only by his finished work that we can be saved. So Lord, we're thankful for the grace that you have extended uh, to these young women and that you have allowed them to hear this good news at a young age and have allowed it to transform their hearts and their minds and have caused them to love you and love your church. We pray uh, that you would give them persevering grace, uh, that their testimony and their commitment to you 
uh, would continue until the end of their life, until the end of their time here on earth, and that would continue with a relationship with you into eternity. And Father, we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, I can think of no better time to sing and respond in worship to God. Can we stand again and, uh, and pull up those song lyrics and let's sing. Let's sing together. Let's sing this chorus. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy.
make this our prayer together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. In the precious fountain, free to all the healing stream flows from Calvary's mouth. A helpless soul, His love and mercy found on me. Then the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. Sing in the cross. Sing Well, good morning. Fun day, huh? It's nice to do a baptism again. It's been a few months. So super excited for the girls and uh, excited to have them here. And uh, excited you're here today. Thanks for taking the time to come out and uh, join us. It's always good to be back together and just have a couple of uh, kind of save the date announcements for you. Uh, in two weeks, uh, we are doing some more training for kids ministry. So if you are interested and willing to help out that way, we've, uh, we've had a couple of new news this morning. One is the first time we've maybe ever done outside baptism as a church. I don't know, I'll check in with, no, nope, Betty's shaking her head, no. So historically, there's been points but in my era here, the last couple of decades, first time. So I'll, we'll, t we'll touch base here this week and get the rest of the story. But uh, we also have kids ministry happening indoors. Whoever would have thought this new innovative thing we're doing of indoor Sunday school with the kids. So they are meeting this morning. But obviously that means with all of the cohorting and grouping that we have to do that we need teachers and workers. And I know many of you have offered to do that. But in two weeks, uh, if you are interested, you can come up to the fellowship hall right after service on November 15th to get trained and equipped for that. And uh, we'll continue to slowly um, re-go inside here as we move forward in the coming weeks. And I uh, also wanted to note that same weekend, the day before, the 14th, the CPC is doing their annual uh, fundraiser. They're doing it virtually this year. And so you can check their website, uh, the CPC website, to get 
uh, info on that, and I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, there's not easier events to attend than the online one. So if you've thought about going but just haven't worked out how to get out of the house on a Saturday night to do it, you can do it from home this year. Um, so you can check things out there, but we'd love to have you participate that way. And then also just wanted to say, if you're new or visiting either today or you have been in the last few weeks, um, we'd love the chance to get to know you and to connect with you. And uh, every Sunday, right after service, we meet inside uh, over here. If you just go into the lobby and up the stairs, there's a room upstairs there uh, for our first step class. And we'd love the opportunity to answer your questions, talk a little bit about who we are as a church and where we're headed, and uh, to just be able to answer your questions and help you acclimate here. And if you have the opportunity to do that today. Uh, we'd love to see you right after service. But let me pray for us and we'll continue uh, with the service this morning. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we're so thankful uh, just for the opportunity to gather, to live in Southern California, where even in November, the weather is fine and we're able to be outside here together. And we recognize there's a little wind today and there's more weather coming, but we know that uh, you are in control of all of that. And it is good for your people to gather. Uh, that we are designed for fellowship, we're designed for relationship with you, and as a result, we have relationship with one another. And Lord, we recognize, as has been so clearly evident this year, uh, that we are not meant to be alone, uh, that we are meant to exist in relationship with one another. So we're thankful for today, thankful for the opportunity to be challenged from your words, to uh, have our hearts convicted about the things that you have called us to, to be refocused, uh, when so much of life is in turmoil right now, when so much of uh, our attention can be distracted by other things, Lord, to be reminded of the things that you have called us to, uh, that we might walk faithfully together uh, as we move forward here and seek to see your name made much of, and that you might be glorified in the way that you so richly deserve. Lord, we love you and we pray for our time now this morning. May you be honored and glorified through all of it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, can we, can we stand together one more time? We're going to read scripture this morning. You can just listen, or if you'd like, this is 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, if you want to look at that on a device or in your Bible. I should say in a Bible or on your device. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 6 says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And go ahead and look over at that last song this morning. We want to set our hearts on Christ again and anchor our hearts in him. He is our treasure. He is our hope. He has conquered death and sin for us, and we have every blessing through him and in him. So let's, let's set our hearts on him together as we sing this last song, Living Hope. Sing the gospel. Oh, great the cat. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kind or through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Is in that second verse? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom? Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross 
As you're sitting down, would you pray with me in response to that? Father, we are delighted this morning to be reminded once again of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that uh, through that power of forgiveness, of your substitutionary atonement for us on the cross, that you break the power of our sin, including addictions, including those things that we feel like we never could be free from. The fact that God viewed you like he should have treated us on the cross and that you took our sin and our shame on yourself and God poured out his wrath for our sin on the son and he gave us his righteousness. I mean, that is is our living hope. We know that this world is not our home, that our hope is not found in horses and chariots. We don't trust in those things. We trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. And that, that is reason to celebrate. That is reason to have hope for the future. And I pray that we'd be reminded once again that we have the best news, the best message ever that's been revealed to us, that not only would we revel in that, but we'd desire to make that known, known to our friends, our family members, and to the nations. And so now, Lord, as we uh, live in these times, as we even look to this week where there will be changes, changes in our government, change in politics, I pray that even more so we would trust you, that you would make it clear who your person is who will lead this country as president, that your your man would be in that role, that that we would trust you in that. And I pray that we wouldn't look to our government for salvation or solutions, but we would be willing to serve those in our community out of that. So now, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our minds, our hearts to the wonderful things of your word, the relevant truth of the Bible. And I pray that we would examine our hearts to see what we truly love, what we're really relying on, what we're hoping for. And if we need to change, I pray that you'd bring conviction to change. And if we simply need encouragement, that you'd bring that as well. 
that we'd be content and satisfied in Christ alone. And it's in his name that we pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning. Man, I'm telling you, it's been far too long since a baptism morning, and uh, praise the Lord, we got to do that outside here. Uh, what a delight. I will just say thank you uh, to these brave, courageous, encouraging young ladies. Uh, Lexi and Sophia, thank you. Uh, people ask me all the time, if I get baptized at this church, do I have to stand in front of everybody and talk? Uh, in front of everybody. Can't we do it in a smaller venue? Uh, can't we do it privately? And I said, no, because you're giving public testimony of the fact that Jesus Christ has radically changed your life. And we want everybody to know that. And so, yes, is it scary? Absolutely. I'm not going to discount that, but, but these young ladies uh, not only showed courage that way, but they got to share their story. And just, I hope if you were coming in late, you might have missed it, but there was a couple things that stood out in both those testimonies. One is the place of the family, right? You heard the, the responsibility we have as parents to model uh, who Jesus Christ is, and to communicate the gospel to our kids. That doesn't guarantee that they'll be saved, but we have a responsibility to do that. But you also heard a couple of names, Ame Caravaggio, Stacy Combe, and others, which I am delighted to hear. These are faithful servants in our church that are loving the, the children in our children, the young people in our youth group, but I, I love it because sometimes we can go about life and we invest in relationships and sometimes we don't get to see the fruit of that. But I love that we get to see the fruitfulness of those efforts and we're reminded that we need each other. None of us, listen, none of us can do any part of life alone, let alone our life in Christ alone. We've been called to community, called with e to each other, and not only are we to receive those gifts from other people, but we, to, we are to give them out to other people as well. So it's, it's delightful to hear those testimonies. Um, also, I just want to play off of what Marshall said. I would invite you, if you are new here, we're recognizing we're getting new people uh, every week. Praise the Lord. Uh, there's still some people that are watching from home. I'll say hi to you as well. But uh, if you want to know more about our church, how you get involved, what makes us tick, I'd love to meet with you right after 1030. Uh, we'll go upstairs in this building. It won't take terribly long. You'll be home by lunch and there's even snacks. So if you just even want snacks, you can go up there. Uh, that's why I actually do it. Uh, yes, oh, oh, shoot. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, hey, congratulations, Dodger fans. I, I've, I've, you know, I've denigrated the Dodgers in my mind all these years. I will continue to do so. I did lose a bet in my mind. I thought Christ would return uh, before they ever won. But uh, I'm glad they, they won a quarter of the World Series, right? It was at about the it was a quarter of a season. So congratulations. If that's what it took, praise the Lord for you. That's all I'll say about that, but I wanted to acknowledge it. Yesterday, uh, a lot of you uh, did what our culture does, and you probably went trick-or-treating or gave out candies. For those of you who helped at our trunk or treat, thank you. Uh, last week, this place was packed, uh, distanced, uh, and, and so, uh, but thank you for helping out with that. But uh, yesterday was also a significant day. Yesterday, uh, we celebrated something called Reformation Day. Reformation Day, I was trying to get my kids, uh, when they go trick-or-treating, to say, Happy Reformation Day, uh, but they didn't do that. But what Reformation Day celebrates is 503 years ago, Martin Luther uh, nailed 95 theses up on a church in Wittenberg, Germany, and he was trying to reform the Catholic Church. And out of that came five solas that we are a product of today. Five solas, meaning that sola scriptura, that we believe that scripture is the final authority, not the church. That we're saved by sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone. That we're saved sola Christus, by Christ alone, and soli dea gloria, to God's glory alone. And it's fascinating because those are, those are the bedrock truths that we stand on today. 
And I was thinking about it in a search for relevance. We have a culture that is searching for what's relevant, what works, what's pragmatic, what's helpful today. And it's, I think that sometimes we approach the Bible and people think, how can the Bible that was written thousands of years ago, over thousands of years, be relevant today? How in the world uh, does the Bible matter to us? And really, it's an audacious claim of, of humanity to think that we're so advanced, that we have so much intellect or information that the Bible wouldn't be relevant. Martin Luther understood 503 years ago that scripture alone is what we stand on for truth. It is where we understand life and who we are and our mission and how God has created everything. And I wanna show you today uh, how relevant the Bible is to your life and to your decision-making every day. And uh, we read it this morning. You can turn over to 1 Corinthians, cha- oh, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We started 1 Timothy, it feels like years ago, it was several months ago uh, that we stopped 1 Timothy. I'm going to finish out chapter 6 here in the next few weeks. And I love these last sections in 1 Timothy. And as you're turning there, I want to tell you a story. It's a story that uh, Luke tells in Luke chapter 12, and it has to do uh, with a man's view of money. And I'm telling you, if you didn't know that this was a story that happened multiple thousands of years ago, this would be a perfect story or something that easily could have happened in Southern California today. There was a man who came up to Jesus And he said, I want you to settle a dispute because we've been left an inheritance and I have an argument with my brother who gets the portion of the inheritance. Now, by the way, if you want to see some ugly come out in a family, uh, bring money up, especially money that's an inheritance that's not clear uh, where the lines go. Have you ever experienced that? I, I've watched it far too many times where all of a sudden uh, families are okay with each other. There's an inheritance and a squabble and claws come out, fangs come out, smoke rises, right? And all of a sudden you turn on each other. There's something that money does in that. And so Jesus says, well, let me, let me take this opportunity to teach two timeless principles, he taught, he warned first about covetousness or the love of money, desiring money. And he also gave a wise command about how actually, uh, how the accumulation of wealth should be used. And so he told a parable. He told this story and he said there was a man who was already a pretty wealthy man, pretty self-sufficient. He didn't need more money, but because he was a landowner and his crops happened to have a really good year, that man accumulated even more wealth. And this man accumulated so much wealth, it was, it was wealth he didn't even know what to do with. He had plenty uh, already to give away if he needed to. He had, he had stuff saved in storehouses, but as he, as he looked at this huge yield, he thought to himself, what should I do with it? And you would hope what he would do is say, how do I give this away? How do I leverage this for God's kingdom? And instead he said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna build bigger storehouses. And so he tore down the smaller ones, built these monstrosities, and he took all this accumulated extra wealth and stored them so he even had more. And then he thought to himself this. He thought, now I finally can do what my heart has always desired to do. I'm gonna relax. I'm gonna chillax, check out, have some me time, eat, drink, enjoy life, and start checking off my bucket list. I'm gonna check out, enjoy my wealth, It's all going to be about me. And you know what Jesus' response to that story in the parable was? You fool. You ding dong. You idiot. All these words. This is why kids are in kids' ministry. I had to get in trouble for saying those words. You fool. Do you understand that tonight your life is going to be required? Tonight you're going to die. And what does all that money do for you? Where does all that money go? It's all for naught. And then Jesus said this this verse, this phrase that we're going to pivot off this morning, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself 
and is not rich toward God. That's the essence of the passage we're going to look together uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And here's, here's the premise, is that true wealth has nothing to do with money. If I can leave you with one thing that you could remember this morning, is that true wealth has nothing to do with money. You could have the most money in the entire world and be the poorest person ever. You could also have no money, be the most content person, and have true riches in Christ. We want to understand that the wise person today will understand the enslaving nature of money or the love of it itself. Benjamin Franklin, he was that one founding father that wasn't in Hamilton. Anyway, that he was... He was real. Benjamin Franklin said, money has never made man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more of it one has, the more one wants. Now, I don't know, I don't know Benjamin Franklin's status with the Lord, but I think he read his Bible, and I also think he understood life. Another one of the most wealthy men ever in America, John D. Rockefeller, said this, I have made millions, but they have bought me no happiness. Henry Ford stated, I was happier doing mechanics work. And the Beatles said, even money can't buy me love. So this morning, I want to examine our heart. Listen, I... I, We haven't talked money in a long time. We're going to walk through this passage, but I want us to examine our hearts when it comes to money and possessions. And our hope this morning is that we will identify areas of misplaced love. Let me say that again. I want want us to identify areas of misplaced love and hope or trust. Those areas that we're trusting in things that are temporal and not eternal and to cultivate in our heart a true contentment with what we have. That's my goal. My goal is at the end of this day that we can have the right perspective of money and possessions and and begin to cultivate a heart of contentment. And in that, that will begin to help shape the decisions that we make. We want to make decisions consistent with biblical truth. Money always factors into our decisions. The older I get, the more I realize that in my home or in the church or in any organization, money factors in. It's always a factor, but it should never be the driving factor. And let me just say as an aside, with a, with a presidential election looming, and there's some uncertainty looming about the financial future of life here in California, we want to be very wise of how we make life-altering decisions. We don't want money factors in, but money cannot be the driving factor in those decisions. Now, before we look at the passage, I want to say a few principles of, of the way the Bible addresses money at all. The first is this. Money is not evil, nor is it wrong, nor is it bad to have it. The Bible never says that money is wrong. Money is kind of neutral. Money is a gift from the Lord. And is it wrong to have money? By no means. Money, like I said, is a gift from God's grace. 1 Samuel 2.7 says, God makes rich and God makes poor. Now, some of us go, man, make me the first one, Right? Curse me with the first one, but God makes rich, God makes poor. He's the one who gives that bounty. Wealth can be a gift as well. It could be a gift. So think about this. In scripture, you have godly people, godly men who are wealthy. Abraham was a wealthy man. Solomon had riches like none other. And Job was wealthy. He had money. It was all taken away. And, and because of his faithfulness, it was all given back. If he hadn't been faithful, God would have said, nah, I'm just going to take it from you. He's saying, no, I'm going to give you wealth. The wealth part wasn't bad at all. Second, money should be held with an open hand and not to be trusted. We can't trust in money. We can't trust in wealth. Disciples recognized in Matthew 19, 27 that they actually had to leave everything and follow Christ. 
Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, riches are by nature uncertain. And if we trust in riches, we will fall. I think we've seen that in America, as you've seen cycles happen uh, in the last century, where people have accumulated fortunes and lost fortunes. We have large 401ks, and then the market dips, and you lose your 401ks. And so, and so is, is money something we should be a wise steward of, invest wisely, save wisely? Absolutely, but we can't ultimately trust in it. Third, money should not be our primary pursuit. Matthew 6.33 says, our first and primary pursuit is the kingdom of God and everything else is added to that. If money is our only or primary pursuit, we are out of balance in what it's for. Fourth, money should be given freely. God loves a cheerful, sacrificial, joyful giver. Money is momentary, so it should be used for eternal purposes. And last, money should never be our identity. It should not be our identity. It shouldn't be how we view ourselves, whether I view myself highly because I have a lot of money or lowly because I have none. And it shouldn't affect how I view other people, like James 2, 1 through 10 says, that I, that I respect people more if they have money and I respect them less if they have none. It's not my identity. It's not who I am. You could have rich people who are, who are people of character and those should be admired. You have rich people who have no character and vice versa. Poverty doesn't make the person, nor does riches. It's what Jesus summed up in Luke 12, 15, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So here is the premise that we're gonna head into 1 Timothy 6 with, is that the gospel changes everything. Listen, the gospel is not an, ad an additive to your life. It transforms your thinking, your desires, your obedience, and for sure, it changes the way you view possessions and money. And so in that change now, we have an opportunity to do exactly what Jesus said in Luke 12, that we are warned against the improper use of money and encouraged to use it properly. So the issue, again, of covetousness and contentment, they are both heart issues. They are not issues of how much you actually have. It's an issue of your heart so the solution to both Jesus' warning and command is actually a changed, soft, responsive, growing heart for a love of Jesus Christ. Well, with that introduction, let's look at 1 Timothy 6 and read, uh, we'll just read these first three verses in verses 6 to 8 briefly here. A Christ-sufficient life produces real gain. Here's what Paul says, but godliness... With contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we should be content. So here's, here's what we have to first see. Uh, we have to first see there's a context going on here, but that contentment is sourced in godliness, which is really sourced in God. If you look at uh, verses four and five, the verses right before, what Paul was doing is there were these false teachers who came into the church who were teaching a false gospel, a false reality, a false truth. And what they were doing is they were leveraging religion. They were leveraging their teaching of godliness or their teaching of the Bible for their own personal gain. Have you ever heard, heard of such a thing? Have you ever heard uh, in modern times that people will use religion to make more money for themselves? Listen, if you ever had this hankering to just throw up all over yourself, if you ever have that desire, go and, and Google the top uh, earning pastors in America. That's a neat one. If you want a little indigestion, if you want a tummy ache, just Google the top 10 and you'll see that there are people, there are pastors who are making millions of dollars in America selling something less than the gospel. That's what was happening in the Ephesian church. Now, listen, God did not call pastors. We don't take a vow of poverty, uh, right? But, but we're never supposed to make millions of dollars either. One million is enough for us. Like that's, that's plenty. I mean, more than that, that's ridiculous. So 
So that's what he's correcting. So he's saying that there was, there was godliness, a form of godliness, but they were using it to gain their own personal wealth. And he flips the script on this. And he says, actually, godliness is of great gain. Godliness is all kinds of gain if it's matched or it produces, it produces contentment. Godliness or godlikeness, piety or reverence is of great gain when it produces what this word is, is and I'm going to say this and I'm going to unpack it, is literally the word means self-sufficiency. What contentment means is self-sufficiency. Now you're going to say, wait a second, I thought we said we're not supposed to be self-sufficient, and you're correct. What Paul was doing, he was, he was taking a, a word in the culture, and it was an Epicurean word, which meant uh, the philosophy was we could live above the fray. We could live above circumstances. We're not, we're not dependent on circumstances anymore. And he took that word and that concept, and he brought it into a biblical term. He made it into or transformed it into a, a biblical term. True godliness produces contentment and spiritual riches, which means contentment cannot be found apart from the gospel. Let me just say that again. True contentment then is absolutely tied into godliness. It's tied into the gospel. You can't just manufacture it. It's something that has to be done in you and through you. Now, turn over real briefly uh, a few books to the left uh, to Philippians chapter 4. Paul spoke on this in another book, in, in uh, the book of Philippians, and he talked about what contentment really is. Let me give you three ideas, three principles of what we learn in Philippians 4, 10 to 13. The first is this, is that contentment uh, is really something that we learn. It's learned. Paul said twice that he had to learn the secret of contentment. What does that mean then for us? That means it's not natural for us to be content. I don't think we come out of the womb. I don't think we get into uh, our younger years and our adult years where it's, contentment's just natural, right? We know that. Why? Because we're in business to, businesses are in business to make money. They, they uh, market to us and we go, man, I want more. There's this insatiable desire in our hearts for more. And so Paul said, I actually have to learn this thing called contentment. It's not natural. It means, listen, tomorrow you're not going to wake up and say, you know what, from now on, I'm going to be content. That's it. I'm just going to be content with everything I have. It means tomorrow you can wake up saying, I'm going to actually learn and grow to become more content in Christ. Second is contentment does not mean you cannot have stuff. Paul said it this way, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. I know how to face having plenty and hunger, abundance and need. See, contentment has nothing to do with how much you have. Paul said he unlocked the secret of contentment by saying, I know that if I have plenty, that I have enough to give away, or if I'm destitute and barely have enough, those factors don't, don't factor into my contentedness. I can be content with either stage. Paul never framed life in terms of having much equals God's blessing and having little equaled God's absence. He took it all from the hand of God. And third, I think this is most significant. If you look at Philippians 4.13, a lot of us know this verse because we, we sign off on this. A lot of athletes use this verse. But Philippians 4.13 encapsulates this, that contentment is truly about being sufficient, not in self, but in Christ. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, self-sufficiency is a mirage. Being self-sufficient isn't real. However, when we are completely satisfied in Christ alone, we can be content with everything and anything else. 
This isn't a verse that promises that we can do anything. It's saying it, uh, the reality that when we're satisfied in Christ, we are no longer captive to the lie that more equals better or that more equals more happiness. So when we are satisfied in Christ and content with what we have, we have real wealth and that cannot be taken away. I don't know if you've ever met somebody like that who is truly content where they have much or little. I would say the one who is rich in contentment or rich in relationships are the most wealthy people in the world. So second, Look, look back at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and look at verse 7. Verse 7. This one's more of a principle. Now he's unpacking this idea. And verse 7 actually starts with the word nothing. And it's, it's the principle, right? I mean, you've heard it before. The cycle of life, we come into this, this world having nothing, right? Not even clothes. We go out of this world. Maybe you're wearing clothes, but you're in a casket. You don't know it. You, you enter the world the same way you leave the world. You got nothing. You don't have pockets on your body to take stuff with you when you die. That's the principle, right? It, that's the reality. The reality says I can, I can hoard and store and gain all of that, but I cannot, I cannot take any of that with me, unless, even if it's buried like the, the kings of, or the pharaohs of Egypt, they buried all their wealth with them and it just stays there in the ground. It means that what we do in the middle of those, from birth to death, it's the middle that matters. It's the middle that matters. What are we going to do to invest properly? There's uh, two things, I think, that Aaron and I, when we got married, uh, the beautiful thing, when you first get married and you're young and married, we were young, which means we had very little money. Rich in love, we would say. I mean, she was like so enamored with me. Uh, in the beginning uh, for the first little while. But we, had, we didn't have a lot of money, and so we could have conversation. And, and by the way, when you don't have money, life's pretty simple, isn't it? Like in the beginning when we were married, it was, we, didn't have, we had bills, but not tons of bills. We ate spaghetti and, I don't know, made that simple dinner together. We didn't have uh, all these financial pressures in the, in the beginning. So we would talk about what do we want to do in terms of money? maybe thinking someday we'd have some. But here's, here, is, here are two things that we, we determined that we've tried to stay true to even as complexities happen, even as these desires of our own hearts are revealed. And these are the two principles. We were gonna try our best not to let money drive our decisions. When we came to this church, uh, I think I was 25 years old, so 17 years ago, you can do the math, 17 years ago, we came here, and when we were offered a position here, the question came, how much do you need to make? I said a million dollars. Just kidding, I didn't say that. I said, they said, how much do you need to make? I go, how much can you offer? Because for us, we believe God wanted us to come here, and, and whatever money could be offered to us, we would make that work because we believe this is where God would have us. And the second thing we determined, and we've tried to live this out, is that, is that we wanted to invest our lives, including our, our money resources, in eternal things. And again, folks, there are two eternal things that you could always invest in. It's God's word, which will live forever, and it's people. So whether it's human resource or financial resources, we wanted those to go to eternal things. Now, that's absolutely been challenged since then, right? You have, you have kids and you have desires and you have wants and you have comparisons, you have live in a culture, all those things. But those are, those are this, this principle that comes out of this. We enter into the world with nothing and we actually leave the world in the same way. It's what we leave behind that matters. The richest person in the world is the one who is content with what they have, satisfied without the need of something else. Out of these riches, they invest in eternal things, knowing that those dividends extend into all eternity. Well, look at the next verse. Look at verse eight. Here's here's the answer to the question. Okay, how much do I need to be content? 
Is there a limit where I can be discontent? How much do I need to be content? Look what Paul says here in verse 8. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Now, let me just say a couple things about this one. One is this. Uh, the idea of clothing, it's a broader term than just the clothes you put on. Clothing also means shelter. So it's the same thing Matthew said in Matthew 6. If you have shelter, clothes on your back, and food, those are enough to be content. Now, what it doesn't mean is that God promises those three things to everybody. Christians have died of exposure. Christians have died of, of hunger, just like anybody else. But if we have those things, Paul is saying, if you have those things, that should be enough. That's enough to be content. You actually don't need anything else beyond that. Notice how he speaks to the basics of life. Money brings complications. We often think, and don't we play this game? Listen, if you haven't played this game in your own mind, you're better than I am. Have you ever played this game? If only I had blank, then I would be happy. If only I could get this house, that house, if only I had a little more, if I only had an upgrade, if I can get this thing, then I would finally be happy, content. And what happens in your heart and your mind when you finally get that thing? Apple comes out with a new upgrade. Somebody else buys a newer car, somebody else upgrades their house, they remodel their thing, and you're like, oh, that's what I really want. Okay, Lord, I take it back. If I had that, then I would be. And so, and so what's, what Paul is unpacking in our hearts is this reality that there's this insatiable desire for more, but he's saying in the simplicity of life, if we have this, we have enough. Contentment can function in the complex, but also strives for the simple. Contentment is more interested in relationships than entertainment, worship than self-indulgent living, service over gaining more. When we are content and satisfied with what we have, we can receive everything for what it is, a gift from God's hand. In other words, contentment moves us away from entitlement that I think I deserve that to covetousness, which says I want that. And this principle, listen, folks, I'm going to give you a little marriage counseling here. If you can truly be content in Christ, listen, then you can take your spouse as a gift. If you are content in Christ, then you also receive the things your spouse does for you or with you as a gift. In, in fact, let me dig down a little deeper. That means that if I'm content in Christ, then I'm not evaluating that my spouse doesn't do enough for me physically, emotionally, or whatever that is, and I stop saying I'm entitled to it, but when it, when it actually happens and that, that desire happens, I say, what a gift of God's grace, but I am satisfied without it. When we think our spouse is gonna satisfy us, we put too much weight on our, on our spouse and not enough, not enough glory going to Christ. So this principle is true. Now, let's look at these last few verses as well. A misplaced love of money produces real pain. A misplaced love of money produces real pain. Look at verse nine. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils, a root that produces fruit of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Notice here, just look at your Bible again. Look at those two verses. Notice all the verses, all the words that have to do with desire. He says desire twice, craving, right? So he's unpacking our heart. It's not money that's the issue. It's our love for it. It's not money that's the issue. It's our craving for it. It's not money that's the issue. It's that we have this insatiable desire for more. Jesus understood that in Matthew 6, 21. He says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. 
So money then is a revealer of our heart, or to say it more clearly, our view of money reveals our heart. And here is the problem, folks. Can I just, can I say this? If I asked you all individually, do you struggle with the love of money? A lot of us would say, no, no, not really, because I don't have enough to struggle with that love. Uh, Most people, most people are unable to come to grips with the fact that what, what Paul is pointing out here, what Jesus pointed out, what the Old Testament points out, is that all of us at some level struggle with this love. It's just we're ignorant of our own struggle. It's a little bit like I've told you before, the struggle that we have in churches of, of segmenting and being in cliques, right? I don't like this church. Everyone just has their own thing. No one reaches out. And I go, do you think this church has a bunch of cliques? They're like, yeah. Are, are you a part of it? No. Is anybody a part of it? No. I'm like, the math doesn't add up, right? So, so God makes a big deal about the love of money. So it's, it's one of those things, you'd be the anomaly if you didn't struggle with it. And it has nothing to do with how much you have. You could be the poorest person of the world and struggle with the love of money. So here's the question I have. How do we know? How do I know if I love money? How do I know if I struggle with the love of money? What are the markers? What are the, what are the things I should be aware of? Let me give you a few uh, so we'll know. Let's go quickly. Somebody asked me, Steve asked me this morning, are you going to go shorter because of baptisms? I said, sure. <laughs> shorter than 1030. All right, here we go. Here's, here, here's, here's some of the issues. Are you more concerned about making money rather than working to and for the pleasure of God? Are you more, when you go to work, when you do what you do every day, are you more concerned about the bottom line of what you make or are you more concerned about pleasing the Lord in your effort in what you're doing? Is it a matter of worship or making money? Second, do you ever have enough? In your own heart, have you ever had enough where you say, I'm actually good right now? Or is there always a craving for more? A constant desire for more, it's a trap. It's a trap, okay? It's a trap. It enslaves us. It enslaves us and we, we spend our life working to get. Then what we get, we try to maintain and end up working to keep what we've gained. It's a slave trap of money. Third, do you define your life by what you have? Do you define your life by what you have? Do you define your life by the car you drive? Do you define your life by the size of your house? Do you define your life by your savings account or your investment portfolio? That when those things are to a certain level, that's who I am? Or do you define your life by Christ? Fifth, do you resent giving your money away? Do you resent giving your money away? You go, I don't resent it, I just don't do it. Do you have a hard time giving your money away? I told you the story when we try to teach our girls how to give, right? Uh, when they're young and we had three jars, they got an allowance, they had cash in their give, save, and spend jars. And when they get birthday money, part of the birthday money goes into give, save, and spend. And at the end of the month, where does this, the give money go? It goes in the offering box, whatever. Whatever we do now, toss it in the trough. So they have give, save, and spend. And, and I overheard my, one of my daughters who will re, remain nameless tell one of my other daughters, who's the youngest, and, and, and the older daughter said, look, psst, you got money now? Don't put it in the give jar. You don't get that stuff back. You, if you put it in the save and the spend, that's yours, but don't, don't put it in that one. And sometimes that's how we view it. We view it that it's our money. And so are you, you know you love money when you have a hard time giving it away. And the Bible always frames giving as sacrifice. Cheerful sacrifice, but sacrifice nonetheless. Next, are you thankful for what you have? Are you actually thankful for what you have? Do you ever just stop and contemplate the greatness of the, the physical possessions that you possess? Do you know that around the world as I've traveled, that people would literally give their right arms to have what you have? Do we just sometimes stop and just thank the Lord that we have options of what to eat for lunch? 
this afternoon, you, you're, not, you're not wondering what you're going to eat. You're going, or if you're going to eat, you're going, eh, what do I feel like today? That is an anomaly in the world. You just stop and step back and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me these things. Is everything framed as a need, not just a preference or a want? Is everything you, you desire a need? I need this. I need this. I can't, I can't be happy or satisfied without it. Or do you recognize that these are just preferences and desires? And it's okay at times to buy things that are your preferences or desires, but recognize that for what it is. Do you spend more than what you have? If you spend more than what you have, you probably love money. Now, I know some situations you're, you just can't make it happen uh, because you're lacking the work, but if you're regularly spending more than what you have, you want, you want what you want now instead of waiting for it. Next, do you sin to get it? Are you willing to sin to get money? Are you willing to cheat, to lie, to fudge the line on your taxes? Are you willing to sin to get it? You know who did that? It was the Pharisees in the New Testament. They loved money, according to Luke 16, 14, and were willing to take advantage of people to get it. And lastly, have you forgotten God owns everything and will require an accounting in the end? Listen, folks, God owns your money. He does. He's given it to you to steward, and one day you're going to stand before him, and he's going to say, what did you do with it? What'd you do with it? Did you eat it? Did you just enjoy it? Did you just buy more for yourself? What did you do with it? I gave you, I entrusted it to you more than I did most of the world. What'd you do with your money? It's all his. And Paul goes on to say that, that this love of money produces, think about all this, that the love of money produces these other sins. It's like, it's this factory of evil out of our heart. If you love money, you're prone to being a thief, to murder, to covet, to lie, to betray, to engage in sexual immorality, to bribe, to cheat, to take advantage of others and show partiality. It plunges us into ruin and destruction. And it finally, it leads to pain. Look at the last verse. Look at verse 10. It leads to pain. We are pierced through with these pains. It's like these, this picture is of these big thorns that, that uh, cut us up. That's this desire for money. It's why the rich young ruler, when Jesus said to follow me, give up all that you have, and he couldn't do it. Do you know what the motivation of Judas Iscariot was to betray Jesus? It was his love for money. He had been pilfering from, the, from the, the money the disciples had the whole time. And so this love of money, he's juxtaposing contentment with love of money. One leads to destruction, even to the destruction of your soul where you choose gold over God versus contentment. So knowing all this, how do we evaluate moving forward? First and foremost, are we investing in the greatest gain, which is satisfaction in Christ, his promises and sufficiency in him? And second, are we identifying areas of our hearts where we're prone to the love of misplaced love of money, which leads to disillusionment? Here's the beautiful thing. Listen, the beautiful thing is how the Bible's framed is it doesn't make your decisions for you. You're free to make choices. You're free to make choices of, of how much you work, how much overtime you work, how much uh, you're going to spend on housing, how much you're going to spend on different things, how much you're going to give away. It doesn't lock you into those things. But listen, that freedom comes at a cost and the cost is knowing your own heart, knowing your own propensity to love, to love money. And so we have to examine our heart. Am I really content in Christ? Am I purchasing this? Am I trying to gain more because I'm so satisfied in Christ that I'm willing to give it away? Or do I feel like I need more to satisfy the cravings of my heart. I'll leave you with this. I, it's one of my favorite passages when it comes to money at all. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, verse nine. It's a proverb written by Agur, the son of ja Jacob. Sounds like a character from the Mandalorian, but it's an Old Testament guy that wrote this. He says this simply, 
Two things I ask of you, deny them not from me. Proverbs 30, 7 to 9. 30, chapter 30, verses 7 to 9. Deny them not from me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord. Don't you see what he's saying? This is the prayer of his heart. God, I just want enough so that I don't want to be impoverished, that I have to steal to make life work because now I'm going to defame your name. But I don't want so much that I'm going to forget that I'm dependent wholly on you. So today, as we think about the decisions we make and think about all of life, especially as financial issues may be changing, the issue is, are we content and satisfied in Christ? And if we are, then we can be content. And I'm telling you, if you are content, you'll be the wealthiest person in the world. Let's pray. So Father, thank you for this morning. What a joy and delight to hear testimonies and, bapt- and, and observe baptisms. Thank you that you're at work in our, in our midst. Thank you that you're at work through your gospel. Thank you that we can meet and gather today. Thank you for a little break in the weather, even though it's getting hot now. We're so thankful that we have these truths. We have a timeless word, and we know that the word of God is the final authority. So we love you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I love you guys. Have a wonderful day. If you're, if you're super hot, take a little dip in here. Water's great. Uh, in a few minutes, if you're new, I'd love to meet you upstairs in the main building. I love you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.